I uh, graduated from the Air Force Academy and uh, spent about seven and a half years in the Air Force on active duty from 1964 to 1971, 71. And I uh, went to work for Rockwell, uh, went to work for Mark Marietta first in Denver and then Rockwell International uh, here in the Southern California area. And then I went, uh, went to work for FAA uh, in 1974, worked for them in, for about 21 years. Retired in 1995 from federal service. Well, I was an air traffic control, air, air, air tra well, basically air traffic controller was, uh, we called it um, uh, ground control intercept uh, controller. And I was a, then I was a missile launch officer. Uh, and then after that, I was um, an engineer uh, at, uh, on the Titan III propulsion system out of SAMHSA or Los Angeles Air Force Station. And um, when I resigned from the Air Force in 1971, I, that, that's where I was located, at Los Angeles Air Force Station. The, the event, the incident, I guess I'd, I call it, happened on the morning of March 16th, uh, 1967. I was on duty along with my commander, Fred Mywald. We were both on duty at um, Oscar Flight uh, as part of the 490th Strategic Missile Squadron, there are uh, five launch control facilities assigned to that particular squadron, Kilo Lima, Mike November, Oscar. Okay, here's Echo, Echo Launch Control Facility is located uh, oh, some 30 miles north of Lewiston. Oscar was another 30 or 40 miles east of Lewiston, November just south of Lewiston. We were at Oscar flight. It was still dark out. Of course, we're 60 feet underground, and uh, there's no way we can see out. But uh, as I recall, it was early in the morning, um, and I got a, I received a call from my topside uh, security guard, who's the uh, flight security controller. I think we call him FSC. Uh, and he said that. Uh, he and some of the guards have been observing some strange lights flying around the site, around the, the launch control facility. Um, and uh, he said they were acting very unusual, just flying around. Uh, and I said, well, you mean UFO? <laughs> I think I use that word. Uh, you mean like UFOs? And he said, well, he said he couldn't. He didn't know what they were, but they were lights. They were flying around, and they, were, they weren't airplanes. They weren't making any noise. They were not helicopters, and they were making some very strange uh, maneuvers, <clears throat> and he couldn't explain them. Well, I told him, uh, y you know, <laughs> I just kind of shook my head and just said, well, call me if anything more important than that happens, you know, I, basically, and we just ended the conversation. Uh, it wasn't more than, uh, well, within a few minutes, I'd, I'd say, uh, maybe a half hour later. He calls back, and this time he's very frightened. I can tell by the tone of his voice, he's, he's very shook up and said, Sir, there's a, there's a glowing red object hovering right outside the front gate. And I'll show you what a, what, where the gate might be located, but he's got a, where he's located, he's got a large picture window of the front gate. And he said, I'm looking at it right now. It's a glowing red object. I've got all the men out here with their weapons drawn. Uh, and of course, he was all shook up while he was telling me this. He was very excited. I didn't know what to make of it, you know. But he wanted me to give him instructions or orders, tell him what to do. And uh, <laughs> I think I said something like, uh, Make sure the perimeter fence is secure, uh, <laughs> and then, and then he said right away. He said, um, "I've got to go, sir. One of the guards has become injured." He hung up. Hung up. Um, I immediately went over to my commander, who was taking a, a nap, 
we have a little cot down there is in a rest period. And uh, I was telling him about the telephone call we just received. And, and as I was relating this to him, our missiles started shutting down one by one. Uh, by shutting down, I meant they went into a, <clears throat> a no-go condition. No-go condition, meaning uh, they could not be launched. So we get, we get bells and whistles, we get a red light, um, no-go condition. And it, it, as I recall it at the time, it seemed like every one of them shut down. But later, uh, in, uh, in recalling this, this incident with uh, my commander, Mywald, uh, uh, he said he, he thought we only lost about maybe maybe seven or eight of these weapons went down into a no-go condition. These weapons are Minuteman uh, 1 missiles. These were, uh, of course, nuclear, nuclear tip, nuclear warhead missiles, uh, the weapons here. So they started shutting down, and immediately he gets up, and we both start querying the... Uh, the status board, we've got the ability to query and and determine what the cause of the shutdowns were. As I recall, most of them were uh, guidance and control system failures. Uh, and then he, he started reporting uh, to the command post. And in the meantime, I called upstairs to find out what the status was of this object. Try to, and uh, the, the guard said, well, the object has, has left. Um, it just, just left at high speed. I asked, I asked him what the object looked like, and all he could say there was a general oval shape, but it was, uh, it was, it was glowing red. It was glowing a reddish orange around the object, and it was generally oval shaped, but he said it was very hard to distinguish any, any features of it, so that's How far away and what else? Well, he said it was hovering right over the fence, and to me, it's, um, that would have been within about, you know, 30 feet away from him. And the fence was maybe eight feet high. There is another incident that happened just within a week of this, week after, where there were radar re reports and uh, quite a few more witnesses. The Air Force did an extensive investigation of the entire incident and uh, was not able to come up with a probable cause for the shutdowns. Um, and I've got quite a few witnesses that will testify to that. We've got a couple of people who worked on the investigative team. Um, and uh, I've got correspondence from uh, the fellow that actually organized the investigative team. And there was no viable explanation for this. Um, each, each missile, each missile, missile is uh, basically self-supporting. The, the commercial, mo most of them are powered by commercial power, but each missile has its own power generator. Uh, uh, the only connection between the, the uh, capsule and the missile sites themselves are, is what we call uh, SIN lines, or their uh, sensitive information network, SIN lines that are basically buried cables. Um, and, but, but inside the capsule itself, and these lines go to the, the missiles directly, the, the missiles are not connected to each other. So having a fault at one site would not affect missiles at another location. And how many total went down? Well, at our site, uh, there were approximately uh, anywhere from six to eight that went down, but they went down in rapid succession, which again is an extremely rare uh, happening. Uh, we rarely had more than one missile go down for any reason at all, you know, um, and uh, this was very rare. There was, uh, weather was ruled out, like I said, an extensive investigation was done. Weather was ruled out, power surges were ruled out. Um, there was only one uh, 
possibility that was uh, was looked at uh, by one of the one of the Boeing engineers that that did some tests in, in a laboratory, and he thought that some kind of an electromagnetic force or field might have might have uh, caused a signal to go, but it would have had to go have gone through these buried cable to each of these missiles. After I talked to my guard upstairs, got the information about about the uh, the other guard that had been injured. Uh, my commander was talking to the command post, the command post, and uh, he finished talking to the command post, and, and he turned to me, my commander, and said, the same thing occurred at Echo Flight. Uh, Echo Flight is another squadron about, I'd say, 50, 60 miles away from our location. But they had the same sort of thing happen. They had UFOs that were... Uh, hovering not, not the launch control facility, but the actual launch facilities where the missiles are actually located. Uh, they had some maintenance and, and security people out there at the time, um, and they were, they were observed, the UFOs were observed by these people out at those sites. Now they lost all 10 of their weapons, all 10. Um, this is around the same time? Around the same, it was the same morning. So that morning, we lost anywhere from, you know, 16 to 18 ICBMs. Um, uh, at the same time, UFOs were in the area and were, and were observed by uh, airmen. The top side guard observed UFOs. Uh, at the time, we lost our missile systems. Um, it also talks about the security team that um, I had sent out to check the uh, security infractions, uh, and while en route back, they lost radio contact. And uh, one of these men, again, I said, was very upset about this whole incident and was unable to return. He says, "I heard secondhand that one was released from security team duties." Those missiles were down the entire day because uh, we've got uh, testimony from. Uh, Colonel Don Crawford, who, who uh, relieved the crew at Echo Flight, and he was there while the missiles were being brought up to alert status, uh, and he said it took the whole day. So I'm assuming it took our missiles uh, the whole day to be brought back up uh, also. Uh, so we got relieved. I went upstairs. First thing I did was look in the guard's eye and say, hey, well, you tell me the truth <laughs> about this, uh, this object. And he swore up and down he was telling the truth. I believed him, I, you know, for a couple of reasons. I, um, I knew he was frightened when he called me down there. And then when I looked him in the eye and he, um, you know, he told me about the situation, uh, I certainly believed him. And, and again, I wrote up a report on this incident. It was in my log, and I turned it over. When we got to the base, I had to... Uh, we had to report to our squadron commander right away. And in that room with my squadron commander was a fellow from AFOSI. We had a AFOSI uh, Air Force Office of Special Investigation on the base. He was there in the office with the commander. Uh, they asked for my logs. Um, he wanted a, a quick briefing, although it seemed to to me, he knew pretty much what had happened already, but we gave him a quick briefing, and then he asked us, asked us both to sign a uh, non-disclosure agreement, saying this was classified information. We were not to release this to anybody, uh, uh, and that was it. And we, we couldn't talk. He told us we could not talk about this to anyone, including um, any of the any of the uh, other crews. Our our spouses, our family, uh, even amongst each other. So we could not discuss this at all. Some weeks before my incident, he received a report um, from an airman on duty saying something was outside the perimeter fence he'd never seen before. The object was lighted and seemed to be watching the site. It approached and repeated, or retreated, and something circled the site. Um, he had this conversation. They. 
Uh, he told the man, to, uh, the the guard, to go ahead and use his weapon, but the uh, but the guard said he didn't think it would do any good. He tried to report it to the command post, and the command post didn't want to receive the report. That was the end of that. That was Eric Malmstrom for another two years after that, and uh, in that time, we were never given a debriefing on any of the incident either incident, either the echo incident or our own, which is very unusual because we got briefed every morning on uh, any anomalies that were going on with the equipment. Uh, we got briefed and, de and dis we discussed these technical issues that were going on with the weapons and all that, but we never heard anything else about these incidents. And, and these were major happenings. They were major happenings. I've got um, I've got a telegram, a copy of a telex, which we received under FOIA, uh, coming from SAC headquarters to uh, uh, Maelstrom and other bases, uh, saying uh, right after the morning that this happened, saying that uh, uh, this incident was of extreme concern to SAC headquarters uh, because they couldn't explain it. Nobody could explain what happened, um, uh, but yet. We never got debriefed, and, and we were cleared for very high classification uh, because these are nuclear weapons we're dealing with. We had we had high clearances, and yet we were never debriefed on this at all. And you see here, there's a reference to a secret message on the same subject here. This is the should be a copy. An exact duplicate. It should be an exact duplicate. But as you see here, under the subject, here there was a reference, but here it's missing. The only other thing I might mention is we did get uh, security incursion alarms at those sites uh, that went when the missile went down. So, which uh, a little unusual. It, well, that is unusual because normally when a missile went down for for something like guidance failure, we wouldn't get uh, security incursion alarms. What uh, does that mean? Security it means there's a perimeter breach. It means there's a perimeter breach that some object crossed the fence or, or something broke broke the security uh, alarm system that we had um, on the perimeter of the launch facility. So I did send out, I sent guards to a couple of those facilities um, to investigate that. Well, the only description I got of movement was, like I said, the first telephone call where they had erratic movement of these lights uh, flying around uh, above the launch control facility. Other than that, the guard upstairs said that the object that was hovering took off at great speed. I mean, he just, would just left rapidly, you know, quickly. The reason I think this story is, is really significant is because going back to um, uh, this August, August of 1966 at Minot Air Force Base, uh, uh, a very similar thing happened at one of the launch facility, launch control facilities at Minot Air Force Base. They had the same kind of weapon system we had, Minuteman 1 missiles. Uh, uh, this was observed on radar. Uh, there was some communication failure. The object was observed over the launch control facility. So, uh, and that happened in August 1966, and that's documented, well, well documented, that incident. Uh, about a week prior to my incident of March of 67, uh, I've got a record of it from um, uh, the, the crew commander. I got a call from one of his security guards who, had, who was out roaming, uh, looking at the launch facilities, and saw an object very similar uh, to what I just described over launch launch facility. Uh, he reported it in. The commander reported it to command post. Command post said they weren't interested in that report. They just didn't even want to take the report. And that happened a week before, about a week before ours happened. About a week to 10 days after our incident, 
There's a very well documented incident that happened at Malmstrom Air Force Base. And in this case, well, uh, uh, near Malmstrom Air Force Base, and, uh, and again, this was another one that was tracked by radar. It was observed um, at uh, close range, relatively close range, by a truck driver and highway patrolman. Uh, and there's a, there's extensive report on that, and the Air Force did an investigation, and there's an extensive report on the Air Force investigation of this uh, of this sighting, this UFO sighting, because it flew uh, around the base, near the base, and uh, uh, very very close to the base. Like I said, it was seen by a truck driver and and uh, a highway patrolman, and and this incident was reported back to headquarters. There's correspondence going back and forth, and I've got some of that. Uh, so this is a whole series of things that happened, uh, uh, having to do with, with uh, the same kind of weapon system, the Minuteman missile. The reports that were made to me by my guards were, were official reports. These were not um, <clears throat> These were not jokes. They were not meant to be uh, anything but official reports because we were dealing with weapons, uh, strategic weapons, during the Cold War, during the Vietnam War. <clears throat> they were very professional, these guards, and they were not about to be joking about weapons being, uh, when, when we had weapons down, about what they were seeing. So these were not rumors. They were official reports. So if, if they were recanted for any reason, these, these men should have been court-martialed for giving false reports or false information uh, uh, during a very sensitive uh, incident. And none of that happened. Uh, none of that happened. Uh, these, these were not rumors. There's nothing about rumors. The primary witnesses that'll verify this incident uh, are, are the ECHO crew the commander and deputy commander, and my own commander, uh, Fred Mywald. Bob Kaminsky was uh, uh, was was uh, he headed up the organization team that organized the investigative team to look at all aspects of these shutdowns. Um, uh, Kaminsky relates to me in writing. I've got it in writing um, that uh, at some point. He was told by his boss that the Air Force had said, stop the investigation, uh, do no more on this, and in addition, do not write a final report. Again, this is very unusual, especially in view of the fact that uh, SAC headquarters was stating, and this is Sync SAC, uh, was stating that this was of extreme importance uh, to find out exactly what happened here. And yet, the head of the investigative team was told that a stop work order was on the way from Oama. Oama is the uh, Air Materiel Command at Ogden, Utah, to stop any further effort on this project. We stopped. We were also told that we were not to submit the final engineering report and not write a final report. I heard that uh, Many of the guards that had reported these incidents were, were sent off in, in, to Vietnam, as a matter of fact. I know for a fact, uh, this I can attest to, that one of the guards I sent out to one of the launch facilities, uh, again, observed an object and came back and was too shook up. I was very shaken by the experience and w was taken off. Uh, guard duty from then on. He, he, was, he was sent somewhere else. He, he was just too shaken by the experience. And to this day, they have never forgotten it. It, is, it, it has been a, a life-altering experience for them. It was off the scale in terms of what the technology for our, our or, or potential targets, Russian targets, were. It was off the scale. They are trained to determine the difference between radar strikes and any atmospheric uh, disturbances that can approximate targets. They're, they're, they're experts at it.